incredible drawing from photographic reference. I always favour a very strong drawing, and I can paint round it afterwards. This is the basic range of colours I use for landscape work. The cerulean blue, ultramarine, Payne's grey, lemon yellow, raw sienna, burnt sienna, light red, and alizarin crimson. I find that these eight colours are quite adequate for the sort of work I do. It keeps the colour harmony over the years as I paint. I use a metal palette with four large mixing wells. And I'm beginning to mix my first colours, which are raw sienna. First wash. And I'm carrying a little bit of it over into the mixing well next to it and adding some um, ultramarine blue. Raw Sienna is taking the edge off the ultramarine a little bit. I'm now mixing some cerulean blue with Payne's grey to make a type of indigo colour. And I'm adding a touch of alizarin crimson to the first mix of ultramarine. brushing in the first washes into the sky and carrying them down over the building but avoiding the white areas. This gives me a nice wet into wet approach to the sky but also colour codes the rest of the painting. The light's coming from the left of this painting and I'm working on Bockingford paper which is a type of knot surface. After I put the first washes into the sky I'll use a kitchen tissue, paper tissue, to form some cloud shapes. I'm working with the paper almost vertical. This is very necessary when you're making video films. It's not the best angle, however, for watercolours, and I would say that 15 to 20 degrees is the best angle for watercolour work. But I have to do this when I'm making a video film. Now the paint's running down and stopping on the hard edges that I've just created, which gives you a beautiful quick cloud effect. And you can carry on brushing the pigment in until the paint begins to dry. All the sequences will be dried using a hair dryer off camera. And apart from that, if the painting takes about 10 minutes to do, you'll see the whole demonstration. If it takes 20 minutes, likewise, you'll see the whole demonstration. I'm now using uh, an oil painter's brush, which I've trimmed, thinned down a little, and made into a wedge shape, which is ideal for indicating foliage. And I'm using it on this tree, this, this conifer tree. Wet into wet now, I'm adding some, a mix of raw sienna and Payne's grey, and allowing it to di diffuse on its own, and keeping the darks mainly to the right hand side of the tree because the light is coming from the left. I'm continuing to work the tree using Payne's grey and raw sienna mixed together and I'll be mixing another mix of ultramarine and light red for a, a much darker colour to use at the base of the tree and I'll use, I'll keep painting wet into wet and allowing it to diffuse. This can be left like this, but you can also add a wash afterwards, a glazing wash to unify the whole tree. And I'll do that in this instance. I'll come back to it afterwards when it's dry. Another glance at the house, the photograph of the house. I haven't used the one on the left, as you can see. I'm um, brushing in some colours for the foliage on the left-hand side of the tree now, using mixes of raw sienna and lemon yellow and lemon yellow on its own and while it's wet I'm running in some other colours Payne's grey touch of ultramarine blue here and there and I'm profiling the left hand side of the building at the same time cutting round the, the roof and the house and the side of the house I'm not putting too much detail into this section I don't want it to, to detract from the house itself 
If you're painting this sort of painting with the hope of selling it, it's a good idea to work to standard sizes. Quarter Imperial is a good size, 14 by 11. Or if you'd like to do a smaller one, 12 by 8 or 8 by 10. And have your mounts pre-made and your frames. And if you've done a, house, a picture of a house for somebody, don't show them the paper. Show them the, the print, the, the, the painting in a mount or in a frame preferably. It looks much better and you'll, you'll get a better price for it. I'm using the side of the brush now, the grey colour, dragging it across the surface of the paper to indicate the foliage. I'm still cutting around the, the building shapes, putting some darks into it now, same two colours. I'm now going back to the original tree and I'm putting a glaze of lemon yellow into it. Got to do this very quickly and very gently so as not to disturb the paint underneath. And while it's wet, I'm just allowing some other, some more pigment to run into it. I'm doing the same on the tree to the right. The fact that it's a different base colour changes the colour to a certain extent. I'm now mixing some warmer colours for the roof and the chimney stacks. I'm using mixes of raw sienna, burnt sienna. And some light red. I lay the colours off a little bit to the side so that when I dip into the palette I can always pick up a slightly different colour. This makes it very very vibrant and also eliminates the need for painting every brick and stone because the paint itself suggests that. You can see that the sky has dried rather nicely using that method of the kitchen towel just lifting off the excess with a dried brush now for the first washes on the roof raw sienna and burnt sienna full round liquid washes taking off the excess again. The paper is such a steep angle that it all runs down very quickly. Now I'm mixing a, a slightly greeny colour into it to suggest moss at the base of the roof and to give it a change of colour. The paint itself has already developed a certain texture. I'm now dropping some ultramarine and Payne's grey in here and there. And that will dry quite nicely, I should think. And for the darker side of the building shapes, um, my first washes are ultramarine and light red, which is my standard purple shadow mix. But before this is dry, I'll run in some of the local colour and it'll mix freely and give you a nice shadow. Beautiful watercolour colour this is. I like to perform the passage in one wash if I can. If I have to two, use two washes, I will, but I won't use three. And if I have to use three, I'll use three, but I won't use four. I know that sounds very complicated. The argument is that I prefer to use a, as few washes as possible. This adds to the speed of the painting and the fluency of it. Watercolours always look best when they're performed quickly. I 
I'm using a, a grey mix with Payne's grey and a touch of ultramarine for the windows. I know the temptation is to reflect the sky colours, but I find this is perfectly adequate for windows. I'm dabbing it here and there. I've smudged one of the windows, and I'll come back to that later and show you how to remove that. There we are, this is where I've smudged it. I've wet this brush with clean water and I'm drying most of it between my fingers. And if I just agitate the surface a little, I can dab it off. Which proves that you can correct in watercolours to a great deal. Now the more, the more I work on that, the more it'll come off. But in fact it's going to be an area in shadow, so it doesn't matter too much. This exercise has taken about nine minutes so far. Back to the palette again. Mixing the grey with light red and ultramarine, a much darker grey. lovely vibrant rich grey and I'm agitating the surface and cleaning it. I'm very fastidious with my palette, I like it to be clean all the time for fresh washes and I often stop during a painting to clean it completely. Using a simple range of colours like this you can always go back to the same colour. When you use a very large palette of colours you can't remember sometimes what you've actually used. using that mix you know, of ultramarine and light red for the shadows now. Now there probably wouldn't be a shadow there but it's helped to bring the porch forward so I've created one. You can take liberties like this it's known as artist license and if you can't get this license anywhere you can always send in for one I'm actually cheating to a certain extent because the in the in the original photograph the light was coming from the right hand side of the painting but I thought it would be better if I changed the angle and get some more dramatic shadows that way. And shadows really help the painting a great deal. I think it really comes to life when you add the shadows and the final touches. But as you can see, I'm keeping it very simple. shadow from the foliage. Now this whole side of the building will be in quite dark shadow. So I'm going right over the window. And when that's dry I'll pick out some detail there. Now using a very fine brush, a number two. My brushes aren't sable, by the way. The only sable I use are, is the big one for putting the first washes on. And I use a man-made fibre brush, which doesn't hold too much liquid, and it's more controllable. The sable tends to suck up all the paint as you dip it into the palette. And I find for this sort of painting, it's, it's better to have more control. But of course, it's a matter of taste.
about 14 minutes into this painting. We've achieved quite a lot in that time, as you can see. Final look at it. You can put much more detail in if you want to, but I think it, in this type of painting it's the lack of detail that helps it. As long as the, the, the drawing, the under drawing is there. The next very, very short demonstration is of a holiday villa in Spain. The building itself is so simple that I, I felt that I had to do a little bit more with the sky. I'm brushing in some raw sienna. And a mix of cerulean blue and Payne's grey over the whole sky. Cleaning up the palette now. I'll use a spray gun. And as I said, I often stop during the, the painting to do this. the edge off it slightly by putting a quick wash of light red over it. I actually made a painting of this for the person who had this villa and I painted the sky very very bright blue. But I'm not fond of very bright, bright blues in the sky. And for the purposes of this demonstration, I've dulled it down somewhat. So it may not look like a Spanish sky, more like an English Lake District sky, but that's as it's going to be, I'm afraid. When I did the painting for the client, I put much more into it. This is a very, very quick demonstration on a piece of 10 by 8 Bockingford. putting this part of the building which is quite in deep shadow just putting different degrees of shadow into it once again it's the shadow that will define all the shapes properly allowing the, the light to catch certain elements. Sometimes these, these different parts of the painting were in deep shadow, but you, you've got to use a little bit of license here to get it to jump a bit. Now I've painted the background with quick washes, grey, raw sienna, blending them together, keeping it rather simple. If you make it too complicated, it is in the distance and it'll detract from the building itself if you overdo it. I'm now painting the foreground in. Picking out some of the flowers with alizarin crimson. It's not a colour that shouts. It's ideal for this sort of painting where the dominant feature is the house itself. 
now using the oil painter's brush again to put the foreground foliage in. Quite dark, which will help to throw the, the building back. quite simple because the building is well forward in the painting. Very similar colours. I'm brushing in some raw sienna into the blue wash. The light's coming from the right hand side of the painting this time. I'm strengthening the blue washes on the left hand side and keeping them light, light raw sienna on the right hand side. Now I'm doing an exercise in putting the shadows on with a light, very light mix of Payne's Grey and Ultramarine Blue. All this will be covered later, but when you have a complicated painting, this isn't particularly complicated, but I wanted to show you this method. It helps you define all the edges. You can have a nice close look at the, the brush that I'm using now and how you can turn it and change the angles. It's really a, a magical brush for producing foliage. If you'd like to pause the, the painting at this spot, you could actually make a note of how I've done it, just cutting it very raggedly into a, a triangular shape and make one yourself. Start off with a, a filbert brush and then cut the shape and then thin it down by holding the, the scissors horizontally to the hairs of the brushes brush. I'm doing all the brighter parts of the painting first and when I put the, re the rest of it on I can cut round it. I find this is a better method of doing it. The normal way is when you work from the back of the painting to the front. But when there's lots of colour and trees and articles in front of buildings, it's better to paint them first. I'm now painting the the tree on the right hand side which is obscuring the building which was actually there. I don't want that to appear in this painting. While it's wet I'm adding the darker tones and allowing it to mix wet into wet still using the same brush. I'm putting a grey mix into the background. Darkening a little bit. And change my brush so that I can cut round the building elements. It's a very useful line when you can paint negatively like that. I'm now mixing some burnt sienna. And raw sienna. Mixing some burnt sienna with the raw sienna. And 
now some light red and some ultramarine for a purple shadow color very useful color I'm also using some ultramarine with some burnt sienna for much darker gray quick look at the palette again of those colors I was using and also of the, the original photograph the light side of the chimney stacks first. Use a very small brush, of course. Changing the colours here and there as I run the wash down. Now using the mixes of raw sienna, burnt sienna, and some Payne's grey. I'm indicating the roof, which is in full sunlight. Waiting to wet texture. Softening it in immediately so it disperses well. re-establishing the shadows under the eaves. Painting the porch rooftop with a similar colour. I must apologise for having to lean into the painting slightly. I'm working to one side at a very, very acute angle and I want to show these sequences in ultra close-up now sometimes my glasses creep in I'm, I'm sorry about that but it can't be helped in this case that passage was dried off camera and now I'm, I'm putting the breeze blocks bricks in which is quite a nice feature actually of this, this part of the roof. Well worth painting. At the moment I'm working on all the lighter areas. But once I start painting the docks, I'm beginning to do that now. You can see the angle I have to hold the, the brush, by the way, when, when I'm working to one side. When I add the darks, you'll, you'll, the painting will get much more depth to it. Now, my first washes are ultramarine and light red. Before that's dry, as I normally do, I'll drop in the local colour. I'm making a pass across all the windows using Payne's Grey, warming it up here and there with some burnt sienna. for some of the woodwork. I'm allowing, allowing the paint to do all the work for me. I'm not trying to paint any detail into this at all. I'm running the wash in wet into wet, changing the colours here and there. And it gives quite an effective way of doing this type of timbering. an important feature on this building. 
for that reason you play it back to a certain extent. And carrying the timbering down into the lower part. Now for the gate, which I want to keep quite light in places. I want it to merge into the building behind. So I'm trying to pick up just the shadow parts in, in the darker colour. That's a sort of lattice fence. I'm trying to scratch it a bit, but I'm afraid the paint's dried rather quickly on me. So I'll come back and add some detail later on. It's not quite the effect I wanted, but each little mark helps the painting. This side of the building is in shadow. That'll help the trees come forward. I'm still using the same two colours, ultramarine and light red for my shadows. This helps to unify the whole painting. And while it's wet, I'm running in some of the local colour. losing it here and there into the foliage. As I said before, shadows are very, very important. This is the cast shadow onto the white building next door, cast by the, the window, the conversion that I've, I'm just painting now. These washes will dry very much lighter and you'll still be able to see the detail underneath. That's the cast shadow again from the casement. Very important. long shadows running along the ground from articles behind that bush and from the bush itself of course I'm going to make a little device here to make the fence stand out a bit more I'm putting a very very light wash above it and losing it into the building with some clean water and that'll help make it stand out. Now, I don't often use gouache but I think it's uh, indicated here to put some detail into the windows themselves. I'm going to make some finishing touches now to this painting. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it will be of value to you.